Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This week's Torah portion, in case you didn't notice, is only one chapter long. Chapter 32 of Deuteronomy. It is always read by itself, which means even though we do a triennial cycle in the sanctuary here, you can't divide one chapter up into three parts. So we read the whole chapter every year. Most of the chapter is a song that Moses sang to the Israelites right before he died. So you could say that it was literally his swan song. When it is read before Sukkot, the Haftarah is also one chapter long, as we noticed, 2 Samuel chapter 22. And by the way, that chapter is also a song, and it is virtually identical to Psalm 18. So, what song would you sing to your family or friends if you knew it was going to be the last song you were going to sing? What final words or advice would you offer? What emotions would you try to express? What wisdom would you try to impart? I would suggest that the message Moses is trying to convey in this one chapter is about the constancy of God's love for Israel. And he's imploring the Israelites to reciprocate by showing love and devotion to God and to the wisdom of this new way of life that Moses has tried to teach them. Yes, if you read the English translation, there's a lot of drama and harsh language about Israel rejecting God and God's allowing Israel to suffer terrible consequences for that betrayal. But perhaps my instinctive distaste for that language only reflects that we live in a cultural world that's very different from the one Moses lived in 3,200 years ago. When you step back and take a look at the chapter as a whole, it is clear that Moses' ultimate intention is simply and entirely to urge loyalty to God and the Jewish way of life. How do I know? Look at the opening and closing verses of the chapter. The dramatic and disturbing language in between is only there to grab the Israelites' attention in a way that they will be unable to brush it aside. Today, we would probably choose to use other inducements or cajolements to try and encourage an enduring, loving relationship with our Creator. But back then, I guess this seemed kind of normal. So let's look at those opening words from Moses' speech. If you want to take a look in your book, it's on page of 1,185 in Eitz Chaim. And he begins, verse 1, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak. Let the earth hear the words I utter. May my discourse come down as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like showers on young growth, like droplets on the grass. For the name of the Lord I proclaim, give glory to our God. Here Moses seems to be saying, I want my words to be as soothing and nourishing as rain and dew, which helps the land to be fertile. Now, I know that the harsh words that follow don't seem to fit with this gentle opening, but again, I think that represents a cultural divide that we can no longer understand. So then he goes on, verse 4, The rock, his deeds are perfect, yea, all his ways are just, a faithful God, never false, true and upright is he. And God is here depicted as faithful, honest, fair, and open-hearted. He desires an eternal relationship with Israel. But, alas, Israel, on the other hand, has not been faithful in this relationship. So, verse 5, children unworthy of his name, that crooked, perverse generation, their baseness has played him false. And then, a very famous line about cultural memory, hearkening to an idyllic past in verse 7, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of ages past. Ask your father, he will inform you. Your elders, they will tell you. Verse 10. He found him in a desert region, in an empty, howling waste. He engirded him, Yesova Venhu. He watched over him, Yevonanehu. And by the way, the Midrash in Yevonehu understands the root of the word to be bina, which means understanding and wisdom, instruction, as in the Torah. So the Midrash understands he watched over him. He watched over him with Torah, with the way of life, with, with wisdom. And then he guarded him, Yitzarenhu, as the pupil of his eye. 
like an eagle who rouses his nestlings, gliding down to his youth. So did he spread his wings and take him, bear him along on his pinions. That is how the idyllic past is remembered. So what's missing from this picture that Moses is painting? Is Moses really telling the story of the relationship between God and Israel from the beginning? Did God really find Israel in the desert? What happened to slavery in Egypt? The dramatic story of the 10 plagues, the parting of the Red Sea. What about the dramatic scene at Mount Sinai with the thunder crashing and the lightning flashing and the earth shaking? Moses seems to be only concerned with the 40 years of wandering in the desert. Instead, what are the three things that are mentioned about God's relationship with Israel? In girding Israel, one could say like a divine embrace, a divine hug. God is hugging us. He is watching over us, instructing us with Torah, with wisdom. And he's guarding Israel like an eagle protects its young under its wing. These are all things that loving parents do for their children. They embrace them and hug them. They give them instruction about how to live life. They protect them from dangers. God is here depicted, in other words, as a loving parent. The drama of the exodus from Egypt with 10 plagues, parting of the Red Sea, the drama of the revelation at Sinai, absent. Instead, we have a portrayal of 40 years of constant care, instruction, and protection by God. That is what Moses wants to emphasize in his swan song, his final words of advice. Not the drama of supernatural effects, but the daily care and compassion of a loving parent and creator. Shmuel Golden in his commentary on Deuteronomy writes, trust is the most critical element in any relationship. The quality and strength of your relationship with another is determined by whether or not your partner can trust you to be there. Moses in his swan song to the Israelites is saying, during the years that have brought you to this point, the most important lesson that you have learned is that you can trust God's constant presence and personal care. True, God performed momentous miracles for you during the Exodus and Revelation. Those events, however, as important as they were, were singular and fleeting. The true measure of God's love for you has been shown through God's constancy, through God's personal care for you over the course of your wilderness wanderings day after day. And now, the same will be asked of you. You cannot fulfill the obligation of your relationship with God simply by being there during the dramatic moments when you need God most. God has shown you constancy, now you must show God the same. Day after day, year after year, century after century, you must prove to God that God can trust you. And that, I believe, really is the central message of Moses' swan song, his final words of advice and guidance to the Israelites before he dies. And it is a message that resonates and has resonated throughout the centuries until our day. Coincidentally, this Torah portion is read either in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, or, as this year, right before Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. And, as we know, Sukkot is the holiday that commemorates the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. The 40 years in which God expressed God's love for us through constancy, embracing us, teaching us, and protecting us as a loving parent. Why is it written as a song? Since I'm married to a cantor, I have learned that music comes from the heart and the soul of the poet and the musician. And music has a way to touch the soul and the heart of the one who hears it. What better medium can Moses use to express this crucial message? So this Sukkot, as we celebrate the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, let's remember it as a gift and a demonstration of God's love for us as a parent who loves his or her child. Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach.